but that's a jump. They raised things six feet. But we're at we're at half. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering because that was raining rain like three weeks. Denominator is it? Well, Big Sur got five inches, over five inches. We didn't. But you know, it's sort of it's been uh, drizzling most days. It's not like you know, every so often it comes pouring down. But it, it, I hope you're backed up. There's been a couple nights where I'm like, oh, I do love the sound of it. It was changing. It's like I'm in bed. I'm like, oh, this is sounds. I'd like to call the March 23rd. Meeting of uh, 2018 meeting of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District to order. Uh, before we call the roll, we have a little different procedure today. Uh, we're going to have a swearing in of a new director. Uh, and I think Julie uh, Sherman will provide those services for Trina Kaufman Gomez of Watsonville. I, Trina Kaufman Gomez, do solemnly swear or affirm, do solemnly swear and affirm that I will support and defend that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the United States of America. All enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance. I will bear true faith and allegiance. Constitution of the United, sa United States. States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to like to say a few words or you're just fine i'm just a uh, welcome yeah i'll get up to speed on what's happening here and um thank you for having me you well okay now the clerk please call the roll director bothworth here director chase here director dutra here director kaufman gomez present director hagan here director leopold here director lind here director matthews here director mcpherson here director rothwell Director Rotkin. Here. Ex officio Director Thomas. Ex officio Director McKee. We have quorum. Thank you. And I do, we do anticipate having Director Rothwell with us uh, within an hour or so. Uh, I'd like to announce that Carlos Landaveri is in the back of the room here. And, uh, if you raise your hand, he will be available for Spanish language interpretation during the meeting. Uh, and for uh, if you'd like any of his services, uh, there are headsets available. Thank you, Carlos. And also, but announce him in Spanish. So, yeah. oh, that he's uh, yeah, in Spanish. Uh, that uh, if you would like to make the announcement in Spanish, that'd be fine. We didn't need to say it in Spanish. Hacer good morning, buenos días, directors. Para las personas que hablan español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Thank you. Gracias. I also would like to announce that this meeting is being televised by Community Television of Santa Cruz County, Channel 26. Our technician is Mr. Lynn Dunton. <coughs> um, now we will go to item number uh, five, uh, comments from the Board of Directors. Any comments that they might have for items that are not on the agenda? Mr. Dutra. Thank you. I just want to say, you know, we're getting ready to go to D.C. to go and, um, you know, advocate for on behalf of Metro, and I just wanted to say that I know that uh, Mr. Rotkin, uh, Mr. Botorf, his first time coming, um, we're going to be going and meeting with all our representatives, as well as with, I would assume, the administration, and um, try to, you know, work hard to get some funding and resources back to um, Santa Cruz Metro. I know that in the past we have been quite successful, and we ha we have buses coming or being built so that we can. Um, start replacing the ones that are failing us. So this is a really important trip. And as we go out there, we'll be um, working and fighting on behalf of Santa Cruz Metro um, against an administration who doesn't want to really fund a lot. So thank you very much. Any other directors' comments? 
Um, any other uh, communications um, from the public that, uh, for items that are not on the agenda? Good morning, directors. Uh, my name is Rick Longinati. Um, I wanted to uh, appreciate the Metro staff for working on a plan to cover everybody who works in downtown Santa Cruz with a bus pass. Uh, they've developed a, a price for that. It would be a pilot program, a one-year program of $311,000 that would be charged to the downtown parking district. And uh, I, this is a, a great uh, pilot and a, and a test for a uh, bus pass program such as they have in the Santa Clara Valley Transit Authority, uh, in the city of Boulder, everybody in the, in the downtown, all the employees of the downtown are covered by a bus pass paid for by parking revenue. Uh, I think this would um, add to the revenue stability of Metro and also increase ridership and also reduce the demand for parking in downtown Santa Cruz, which would be a benefit to the merchants downtown. So I have a letter here for you and just encourage you to, to uh, give staff a pat on the back and encouragement for this program. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. That's an extra pat on the back because we really do appreciate our staff and the drivers and what they do for us. They're, they're our, what make us, um, make us run on time. Yes, sir. Good morning. Brett Garrett from Santa Cruz. And I, I agree with what Rick just presented. And also, I was at the transportation conference this past Saturday, and I want to thank uh, Barrow Emerson for coming and speaking to us. He discussed Metro's challenges very frankly. I uh, said we need a game changer. I agree we need a game changer to address these challenges. Operating cost, running buses are expensive. Service frequency every half hour is really not enough. Operating hours, difficult to operate late at night. Traffic delays, of course, and the delays of each passenger at, at the stops along the way just because of the nature of a bus system. So I'm here to propose a possible game changer um, that I've talked to some of you about before. Um, I advocate for personal rapid transit, PRT, small automated pod cars on an elevated guideway. It does solve operating cost, possibly. Um, the system in Morgantown, West Virginia, I've read different amounts about how much it costs to run, but under a dollar to a dollar fifty per passenger, that's uh, 3.6 miles in each direction, so there'd be a little more for connecting Watsonville to Santa Cruz with a PRT system. But uh, it could be a tremendous savings in operating costs. Also, service frequency. PRT is an on-demand system. When I show up at the PRT station, either the pod car is waiting for me or it shows up shortly. It solves operating hours because it could run all night silently, um, at least in theory. It solves traffic delays by going over traffic. Um, solves delays at each stop along the way because it, it, when I get off the the pod car it stop it pulls off to the side to the station, and the other pod cars just go around. And from a climate ex perspective, could be run by solar panels, and just intrinsically uses less energy per passenger than a typical ba bus or train because you're not lugging all this um, heavy. It, it doesn't have the um, the bus running with two passengers and an enormous bus is is um, less efficient than a pod car. Um, and profound safety advantages. So if we need a game changer, I really suggest looking at PRT. Um, the RTC's unified corridor study is for the long term, and I insist that to be complete, it, it needs to be looking at this modern technology. It provides what transit advocates want, it provides what trail advocates want, and I think it provides what Metro wants. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public on items that are not on the agenda? Yes, my name is Robert Kibrick. I'm a 45-year resident of Santa Cruz. And um, I want to first thank all of you for your service to the community. And I want to thank Santa Cruz Metro for reliably getting me to and from work at the university over a period of 36 years. I'd like to second the comments that Rick Longinati made in support of this pilot program for the downtown eco pass and just to describe my personal experience with a similar program for UCSC staff when I started working there in 1976 uh, staff members had the option of getting a free Metro bus pass and um, I had a car I could drive to work if I wanted 
but parking permits then cost several hundred dollars a year. They now cost $864 a year for a parking pass. So there was a strong economic incentive. I also found that although I could drive to campus faster in my car than I could get there on a bus, I could get to my office faster on the bus. Why was that? I could be to campus in 10 minutes, but once I got there, even if I had a parking permit, I could be driving in circles trying to find a parking space. And when I finally found one, it might be a very <coughs> long walk to my office. So I actually found the Metro got me to campus at least as fast and as often faster than it would in my car. It was more cost effective. And so I was a bus rider by choice. And this was a fabulous uh, capability. Now, over the next few years, gradually, the university started charging a modest amount. First, I think $3 a month, then 5 then 8 I think that they're now charging $14 a month for the staff bus pass. But it's still an incredible bargain when you think of the savings of, of you know, $864 for a permit, which doesn't even guarantee you a space, the cost of gasoline. My insurance rates on my car were lower because it wasn't listed as a vehicle that I commuted to work in. And so I in, in imagine that over the 36 years I worked on campus, I saved many tens of thousands of dollars. And I also enjoyed uh, a more relaxed way of getting to, to work because I didn't have to worry about finding a parking place when I got there. And I would also like to commend Metro on having tremendously courteous and wonderful drivers and a, a reliable service. So I think there's a huge potential for this pilot program to have similar effects downtown to save the number of parking spaces you have to build, maintain, and enforce parking regulations on. So I would very much like to support this concept and hope that it goes forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. That'll be our next promotional advertisement. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank, you. Good. Yeah, we thank, thank you for taking the time to come down and share your experience. Yes. Appreciate it. And in general, I want to say uh, thank you to the University of uh, California, Santa Cruz, uh, for the cooperative efforts uh, and the uh, the knowledge that they have of uh, our needs and their students and staff's needs, they've been tremendous throughout the years. So I want to compliment uh, UCSC for everything they've done in cooperation with Metro through the years. Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, uh, Mike, how are you uh, today? Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit um, uh, uh, to advocate for uh, changes to the Highway 17 uh, uh, transit um, that we have, the mass transit that uh, connects us to uh, San Jose. Um, I was told by a VTA representative that they're going to have a BART um, terminus uh, next to the Great Mall in Milpitas as soon as this fall. And one thing uh, that I've talked to a lot of drivers about, and they, many, many occasions, they've said, oh, you should send a letter to Alex Clifford or you should, uh, you should, you know, you should tell the, you know, you should, you should go in front of the Metro board. But I feel this is actually more appropriate body to speak to because this is, as far as uh, everybody here who's spoken uh, has uh, been talking about ma uh, mass transit and public transit. Um, I think it's, I think it's a very important aspect of transportation in this county, especially as uh, things grow and develop. Um, so uh, basically, uh, my interest is. Uh, in, in, in ho I've been riding the buses since uh, I was uh, I was 15 in the mid 80s, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, they they came up with the the 17 Express uh, around the time of the earthquake. I don't remember if it was right before or right after the earthquake, but they had the 17 Express from that point, and they haven't revised it since. And they've since gotten light rail all the way down to um, Winchester, uh, which it just passes by. You just go by and you go. I wish I could get off there and go to the light rail and go directly to the light rail. And so I'm just I'm just suggesting or inviting you to to consider the possibility that it's maybe time to um, revise that uh, that uh, and even though it's like five different agencies and it's a it's a hairy mess um, from the standpoint of politicians who have to do all the work. Um, I just think it should be kind of uh, looked at as as something to be um, you know given more consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank suggestion. You. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Joshua Stevens. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz City. I wanted to also commend the Metro for sending out Barrow Emerson to last week's Transportation Justice Conference. It was great learning more about the Metro system and 
its struggles it encounters. Um, and I felt that was actually a great tool to outreach to the community. Um, I also agree with the prospect of bus passes downtown, um, the EcoPass pilot program. That would be a great addition. I, for one, work at an employer that is grateful enough to provide commuter benefits, and I think that's a great way to incentivize ridership in general. Um, I just wanted to also note that I, on my bus ride experiences as of lately, there's been a lot of buses showing the time 1998 for the year on their display time clock. I've noted that on buses 2308, 2211, and 9823. <laughs> Not sure what that is, what's up with that, but they seem to be having a little glitch there. Um, I also wanted to advocate for seasonal fair sales. I noticed one, I remember when you guys did that one year, uh, the youth summer discount, that got a lot of people aboard. Um, great incentive. Um, and also consider uh, just general. Uh, flash sales there. Um, I also noticed that the fair structure was planning on, the, the discussion is planning on being put on hold because of the SB1 um, unsurety. And I also wanted to remind the board to keep in mind that when it comes to our Highway 17 bus service, we're paying $7 to go about 23 miles when our peers down south, Monterey Salinas Transit, charge 350 for about 30 miles of travel between Monter the Monterey Peninsula and Santa Cruz County. So please keep this in mind when we're working on, or when this discussion gets brought back up again, because I feel that is an important um, piece as to why ridership might be declining um, on our express service. and. Uh, let's see, and one last item is to also consider flash sales for small business. If they say that 82% of businesses in Santa Cruz County are of micro or of less than eight employees, be a great way to outreach to boost advertisement sales. All around, I just wanted to thank the Santa Cruz Metro Board for all they do, and can't wait to see what we can get with all these upcoming opportunities for funding and everything of the like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to, from the public, would like to address this? Oral communications, thank you. Hello, I'm Dana Badshaw, and I started the Bus by Choice movement here in Santa Cruz. We're working hard to change the mindset from the idea that the buses are just for poor people who don't have cars to saying everybody needs to get on the bus. and. So I really applaud the step in the right direction of the Metro passes being offered to the downtown employees. I think this is a great step in the right direction. It will encourage people to get on the bus, try it out, and save space in parking downtown. So thank you for having a good service here, and we just need to make it more, <laughs> more public, make it I mean, the future is in public transit. We've got a public transit right here, and we need to support it by using it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Susan Cavalieri. I moved here from New York almost three years ago now. I chose not to have a car here in order to cut down on my greenhouse gas emissions. I am extremely concerned about climate change and its impact on Santa Cruz and the world. Um, I am also concerned about the future for my grandchildren. Since I've been here, I have not needed a car. I do ride the Metro frequently. Um, I am always impressed by the courtesy of the bus drivers by their concern about other people who may be lying on a park bench. Um, they um, are a, a real asset. Um, I support the EcoPass. I believe that public transportation is absolutely essential if we are going to have a future. And I um, thank you very much for 
the service that you offer. It would be wonderful to see it improved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to? Becky, do you know? Okay. Anyone else yeah, from the public? Yeah, yeah, no, you do. Yeah. Okay. My name is Becky D. Taylor, and I just want to reiterate the last two speakers who said that they took the bus by choice because I've been writing them. Mitchell on and off for the past um, almost the 30 years now. And at one point, my uncle was, was trying to get me to look into do 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 driving a car and I just sort of saw that as more hassle than it was worth because because I like the buses so much and so thank you very much. You thank you, Becky. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to address us on items that are not on the agenda? Okay, we'll move. Is there um, any communications from the MAC? Communications? No? Okay. Uh, labor, labor organization communications, item number eight. Do you have any comments from labor? Good morning, board members. Uh, Michael Rios, PSA uh, pre president, uh, leader representing SEIU. Uh, I'm up here just want to congratulate uh, Director Gomez and your new appointment, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Hi, I'm Joan Jeffries. I am the chapter of the SC uh, president of the chapter SEA, um, also part of SEIU, and I would also like to congratulate and welcome. Um, Ms. Gomez Kaufman, Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, a it's a mouthful, nervous. sorry. I'm a little nervous today, um, but thank you. Um, hello, my name is Juan Garcia. I'm the uh, VMU president representing the mechanics. Um, I'd also like to uh, congratulate uh, Ms. Gomez. And uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to bring up at this time, um, earlier, I think it was last week, there was a driver appreciation day um, where we had some kind of breakfast served and everything. <clears throat> I'd like to bring to the attention that not everybody was notified that this was going to occur or uh, if we weren't notified, needless to say, we weren't invited. So there was many people I've spoken to in the different uh, chapters of uh, SEIU represented members that feel uh, the same way as I do that uh, perhaps if there's no appreciation day for mechanics, office workers, or, you know, uh, custodians, uh, vehicle service workers, and the like, um, we feel underappreciated. So my suggestion is perhaps if the board would consider or the powers that be consider making an appreciation day for all Metro employees so we don't feel left out and we all feel included, and I think you'd get a happier workforce with a higher morale. That is all I have to say. Thank you very much. The other, oh, yes, Eduardo. Eduardo Montesino, um, uh, representing the bus operators and paratransit folks. Well, the, the, the operator is just going to thank you for that appreciation. I'm putting that in anyway. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I want to welcome you, um, um, 
it's Kathleen Gomez to our, our, um, our organization. It's a, a wonderful place to, uh, to be. Oh, I've been here for, you know, a few years now. Um, so I just want to welcome you. you. Um, but I also wanted uh, um, to, uh, for everyone to look at, you know, as <coughs> we have ventured into uh, getting Measure D money, as you know, um, and uh, at the state level, we're getting, you know, S uh, state transit assistance, uh, more, uh, more money. Where now we're going to look at even with the fair restructuring. Where are we looking at the, the service that we provide? We we still got, have a lot of gaps in service. We're still not providing the services that we need for the services industry that we're we're you know tasked to uh, to provide service, especially the, the, you know the service industry here in in this community. So um, as we look at um, budgets in the future and as we look at the fair restructuring, we should also be, you know, emphasizing what are we gonna, uh, um, gonna do for about the service. It's a, it's a, and it's not a lot, you know, it's not a lot of investment, but we do need to cover some, some gaps, especially nights and weekends. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else, uh, from labor that would like to address us? Okay, we'll go on to the next item, uh, item number nine. Is there, are, is there any additional documentation? We have, um, oh, okay, we're fine, okay. Uh, we'll move now to the consent agenda. We would like to recognize that uh, Director Rothwell has been with us now for about 15 minutes. Thank you for attending, and uh, we knew that you were gonna be a little tardy, so thank you for being here. Now, it's stuck in traffic, stuck in traffic. <laughs> okay, right. Way to get called out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, we will go to item number 11 uh, for recognition. Uh, no, I, I think, I think. Oh, excuse me, Norm. Uh, concerning on item 6, description of claim, Cita Garcia. Ten, you mean 1006? Which, uh, which, uh, which, which item? item? Are you talk, you're talking about agenda? Consent agenda? The consent, the, consent uh, agenda. Consent agenda. On okay. the consent, number 10. Yeah, 1006. Okay, got it. Item okay. 6. Lucy, Lucila Garcia, while I accept the idea of rejection, I want to inform that we have a severe problem of buses getting to the side in Santa in Watsonville, especially on uh, East Beach and East, primarily on East Beach. I saw yesterday in the rain, the day before, both people having to enter in between cars to get on the bus because the buses cannot get to the curb. They were stepping in mud puddles or rain runoff. Elderly women wait literally ankle high water in some cases. This situation of this problem, <coughs> a lawsuit, I see as a severe problem especially on East Beach, which I ride virtually five, six times a day on, uh, on 79. Are people parking in the bus stop? Is that what's happening? The, among other things, there are the red spot marking, it may be three feet, especially on Hushbeck. It's known as it's not locked, this, the bus pullout's not big enough for the bus to get into. Right, it, there's it? no way they can get on t over near the bus about near the curb. And this is a claim that is uh, 10,000. And I see in the future much more if these people are aware of they can uh, get some access to it. And uh, Norm, what are you talking, which one are you talking about? It's not 10-6, it's something I think else. You're eight. Eight. Are you, I don't know what you're talking about. Ten what page are you on? 10-01.2. A reference to where the claims go. Oh, 1001. Oh, 1001. The third item down. Oh, it's a tort claim, number 1001. You said six, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's 1001. And we got it. This. The page number. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. But it's, yeah. Thank you. This is merely one situation. If you saw, as I do, riding the bus almost every day on, on East Beach, that the number of people who literally are in between trying to get to the bus access 
the bus can't get close to the curb. The red markers, maybe three feet. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to pull this and have some extra action or direction. For, for uh, I'm saying that we need to look into the problem of access bus to curb. But you know what we should do is ask the uh, staff to contact uh, Watsonville. We don't control pullouts, but if there's yeah. a problem, we should have our staff contact the city of Watsonville, ask them to look into the, particularly on East Beach, if that's where the problem is. And, yeah, I think and so. We can't that, take any other action today. Yeah, we can't. On that, yeah, but I think we should ask for that. We'll, we'll um, or excuse me, you want to, sir, do you have a comment? Just a quick comment uh, to address this particular uh, Lucilla Garcia. Uh, the incident that took place was basically at the uh, Watsonville Transit Center, and it was just an angle issue. Uh, we attempt to come within uh, six inches of the curb in order to allow people to egress or uh, board the bus uh, in a manner that's safe. In this particular case, there were some other buses there and the operator was unable to achieve the angle that necessary, so there was a, a little bit larger gap and she missed the step. Uh, but I will be looking into the issue that you're talking about and we'll review that. Thank you. Is that because the buses were parked there for um, like break, they were on break or something and they just left their buses parked there? Well, they we share the spot with MST and our buses, so consequently, the, there's periods where there's quite a number of buses there, and the space area is probably not that long in order to get the angle that we need to approach. So the last bus is kind of at a disadvantage. Right. I, apparently, I made <clears throat> the wrong direction. I had nothing to do with this claim. No, I understand. Yes, it but was it's, the it's, access it's to the curb. Access, got it. We'll, we'll, we'll hook up and okay, take a look at that and get back okay. to us. Okay, very thank well. you. Uh, just, just want to note, thank you, that we are actually doing a lot of the red, cur red curb painting. So what we'll do mm -hmm. is indicate that for them to take a look at and include um, the safety measure for the width that's necessary for those buses to come in. We'll place a recommendation in there. I'm aware of the new painting. Mm -hmm. The problem is. You need to expand from three feet. She said, she right. said that, yeah. Yes. Right. Okay, very well. Anybody else have any comments on the consent agenda? I would move the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. The, uh, all in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 You have a motion? Yeah, I made it and seconded it. Missed it somehow. <laughs> Anybody from the public? Are you guys were talking? Any opposed? Did you get your coffee? <laughs> okay. All right. This is a weird day already. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. Maybe if we change the, the lighting, lighting, I guess. Uh, um, uh, now we uh, uh, we'll go to <laughs> item number eleven: uh, presentation of employee longevity awards. Uh, I understand that two of the uh, recipients are not here. Uh, Patrick Fortune is not here, and um, Maurizio Italia is not here. But present, I think we have John Nevin, a uh, tenure employee. Is that correct? Come on. Thank you very much. Oh. Somebody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now we know why they're not on. Yeah. Uh, They'll be like. <laughs> somebody get that. Is, it, is the award, where is that? Is it right there? No, the awards are right up here with the. Oh, you do the got button. it. Okay, we want to thank you for your service in 10 years, and please, uh, a yeah, couple Tom. comments if okay, you would. Tom. Thank you, uh, Metro Board. Good morning. All the work you do, uh, it's uh, 10 years, sir, sure, flies back. Uh, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. I'd um, like to thank the community, you know, the passengers. Uh, Becky, I used to drive around. Norm, <laughs> as a bus operator when I started. Um, and it's just an honor and pleasure, privilege to serve the community, work with the public, which I enjoy. And um, with the bus operators, I'd like to thank maintenance, fleet, facilities, HR, administration, who I get to work with, Santa Cruz Police Department, you know, during Halloween traffic <laughs> and different uh, first responders of Santa Cruz. Um, it, it's certainly a pleasure to work with, uh, continue to work with the public. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and our Vice you. Chair will present you. Uh, with that, I will present you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now uh, to going to item number 11, approve the establishment of the second Friday of every month for board committees to meet. Uh, discussion from the boards. We've, this is 
had some discussion on this. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Um, Leopold. Yeah, at, at the recent finance uh, committee meeting, we actually did sort of set up a schedule yeah. that is not a Friday. Uh, we the, we we're, can keep we're that. We're sticking to those. Okay. Yeah, don't give up. <laughs> we yeah. are sticking to those. <laughs> Finding a date is very hard. We are sticking to those. Okay. Yes. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Director. Clifford. This is, a, this is an item that's sort of a plea for help, if you will. Um, we're, we're struggling. We, we have this um, great new program that you put in place to have uh, standing committees, and a lot of good work is getting done in the standing committees, but we also need the standing committees to happen in a fairly timely fashion and so, so that we can take important items to the committee, flesh out the details, and bring a recommendation back to the board and meet our posting schedule, which is fairly complicated and limited. And any committee meeting and a regular board meeting. Um, and your, your calendars are just massively complicated. You, you are very mm -hmm. difficult people to get together in the same room. And then sometimes, uh, from time to time, our chairs of the committee want to make sure 100% of the committee members is there. And so that complicates it even further when we're trying to make sure we only hold a committee meeting with the people there. Um, you might recall that um, several years <coughs> ago, uh, actually not long after I got here, you were meeting twice a month, the second Friday of the month and the fourth Friday of the month. And at some point in the past, I understand this board had standing committees and then they, they morphed into kind of the, the assumption that the second Friday of the month would be a work session and the, the fourth would be a board meeting. And then that morphed further into just two board meetings every month. Much of a work session, and then uh, at the chair's urging, at, at Bruce, Mr. McPherson's urging, about three years ago, the board considered eliminating the second Friday of the month and just doing all the meetings on the fourth Friday of the month, in order to help us logistically be able to produce all the quality materials that you would like us to produce in a fashion. That has worked out really well. Um, we have been able to yield some savings in staff time and reinvest those savings, and that has just been really good for the community. But now we're, we have these standing committees, and we've sort of tried for the last year or so to figure out how to, in an ad hoc-ish way, meet with, you know, reach out to each of you and figure out how to coordinate your calendars. And it, it in some cases, becomes a full-time job for Gina to do that. Um, so what I'd like to do is to go back and reinstill the second Friday of the month on your calendar and do something similar to what the RTC does. If there's no business that month for that particular committee, then we'll notify you in the same fashion that RTC would notify you. Um, to, to let you know that you won't be needing to meet that, that week. We try to get, under this proposal, we would try to get all of the committees to meet on the same day so that we can have two board meetings. Maybe we would have a, a 9 to 10 or 10.30 and 10.30 to 11.30 or 12, that kind of a routine. So we bring you in in a sequential form if, if all the committees happen to meet, be meeting on that same day. So that, just doing that would help us tremendously. You, you note in the recommendation that I suggest we not start it till June 8th because we do have some committees that are already pre-scheduled. And if you agree with this, it'll take you a little time probably to coordinate your calendars so that you can wipe out and commit um, second Friday of every month to us for committees. That's my plea. That's my cry. That's my... Do you have any uh, sense of wh wh which committees would come first, so to speak? I mean, not that they're better than the others, <laughs> but uh, like Cross -cross. starting at 8 o'clock and then going through noon or something like that, uh, which ones? I mean, if we could get a, uh, a calendar year uh, in advance in, in, for that second Friday so we know if we can get it on our calendars and that's where we are at 9.30 or, or whatever it is, uh, if we could do that. Can do that for can, you. I'd like to see that first, though, because I think that it's important to see if, I mean, which, 8 o'clock, I don't want to start 8 o'clock. I mean... <laughs> This is so Dutra's not at eight. Everybody <laughs> else, wherever. <laughs> Everybody else <laughs> yeah, I'm put me like <laughs> down here. No, we're, 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 <laughs> we'll the details will coordinate with you carefully, but this this idea, this principle of meeting on the second Friday is really what I see. Director Matthews, I, I would just actually like to move that we go ahead with this. It makes total sense. We all waste so much time doing the doodle polls and yeah, blocking out I 10 different it. possibilities. So um, I commend you, and uh, we'll try and refine it. But okay, we'll, we won't have you can be at eight then. It's good. Yes, okay. I agree. <laughs> I can like eight, but I'll yeah, do one. Yeah, yeah, I would do that. I would do that too because I have some things later. I'd rather meet at eight o'clock and get okay. the court. Yes, yeah. 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 you know, it might be a good idea for. Uh, 
directors to say uh, maybe they do have some standing appointments or committee meetings. If you do, uh, I would uh, you know, on Fridays let mm -hmm. for some other committee or something. That would be good to know for him. So you know which members can do. Let's let's give the direction. I mean, yeah. we do this in okay. council. I think others do. You just block it out if you need it and. Yeah. And then you adjust your calendar. Okay. I'll second that. I know Mr. John's Leopold. been yeah. trying to. I know, I've seen John. John's hand up there, and I think yeah. it. Director Leopold. I'm honoring that I'm waiting for to be acknowledged by the chair. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, um, it's. I, I know we were looking for a date for a retreat, and that might be an excellent opportunity. That's mid mid to late August. We hope we're still trying oh, so to. So that's that's off. way way off. Yeah. Well, okay. I was thinking left. that that would be a chance that we could map out the uh, schedule. But. And that won't start till nine. And so whatever it is. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, uh, yes. I say it's like it's like herding cats. I guess that's that, is that the, isn't that the saying? But um, but I just want to say that I, I am supportive of this. But I just want to make sure that um, I could like to I'd like to see how that you know you're going to schedule out the committees. Um, and then also, if that does happen, if we're going to keep, if the first committee doesn't stay at the same time, like say, say it's the dir director's committee or executive committee or something, or, and then they don't have a meeting, the other ones will still stand, right? You're not going to move everything up. I, I would guess not. If we try to juggle them just because we canceled a particular meeting, that just adds another layer of complication. Okay, good. I think if we say finance always meets second Friday, 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. That's one. You can put finance first. That's one I will never sit on. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> chair, uh, chair of that committee. We've already uh, established a meeting time. <laughs> okay. Several of them. Is there, are there any other comments, suggestions? Um, uh, yes. Just in order. Question, I think. Oh. So, so what I think I'm hearing, just to be clear, is that we're going to establish kind of as much of an advanced schedule that we can now. My question is before that, do you want me to send out a placeholder from 9 to noon, from June to December, or do you want us to wait until we actually have that schedule in Let's place? Let's wait until we have it scheduled, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll send something out, or actually I'll ask Jean if she would send something out, um, capturing our proposed schedule, and uh, if we don't get any negative And just for housekeeping purposes, if you can give me the different committees so that I know who, what, when, the frequency, maybe the duration, maybe even a set of the, the minutes from the last meeting so that I have, I'm a bit more familiar with well, what committees. I think you're taking over Oscar's committees, so. Okay, well, just so that I can take a look at all of them and then knowing which ones are going to be relative to what I'll be taking on, well, that would be helpful. I couldn't send out the roster until I've got you, but now I've got you. Thank you. So the roster will be coming out, and then I'll just provide you separately soft copies so you've got. I appreciate it. Thank you. And they're all online, too? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I don't know if the, the public would have any comment on this. Probably don't want to get involved. No, you do, <laughs> I know, but uh, no, that's okay. Um, okay, today. we'll just wait for that yeah, then. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on. Um, I, on I don't know if we need a vote on that. Yeah. Really. We got one. We had, um, yeah. we had a first and second, but we didn't second, vote on it. But we never voted. It can be a change second. for the second. We have to vote. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. We will now go to the CEO's um, oral report. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And, and thank you for the last item. I sleep well tonight. And I'm, uh, <laughs> Gina will have some time. She can reinvest in other activities. Yeah. <laughs> so thank Poor you. Gina. You'll be doodling in your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> we may miss those. Okay. A number of items for you. And uh, thank you, Ch uh, Chair, for allowing me to move the uh, CEO presentation up a little earlier in the agenda when I can have you nice and fresh instead of at the tail end of the agenda when you're ready to bolt out the door. Uh, it, it'll make me feel a little bit less uh, stressed, too, to, to be able to do this earlier. I wanted to uh, go back to the EcoPass just real quick. Um, you had all of these folks coming up and thanking you for something you actually haven't seen yet, and you're probably saying, when did we act on that? I feel so good about it. Well, you didn't. Um, what's happening is in the backdrop. Uh, city <laughs> staff and metro staff have been meeting about the concept of a downtown eco pass. The city reached out to us. We've had several months worth of back and forth trying to figure out how best to make some sort of proposal. Um, the city is, is seeking to deal with some of their issues related to transportation um, demand. Um, management, um, as, as they look at uh, increasing municipal parking in the downtown and balance there, how do you encourage people to, to get to the downtown some other way than a single occupation? 
vehicle. So they're struggling, I know, with that. Hopefully I captured that right for the city. And uh, from our perspective, we'd love to have more customers. It's going to be a win-win, and we just need to figure out the economics of it. So at this point, what has happened is, is our staff and city staff have met. We now have a proposal that the city's reviewing. And once we hear back from that, um, we'll, we'll have to take it to the two bodies. For them. That's why you haven't seen it yet. It's strictly just a, a backdrop. But know that we're working, both parties are working in earnest to try to figure this out. We think it's a positive thing. Um, Transit Appreciation Day, thank you for the board members that could make it there. Believe me, I realize that your calendars are getting complicated and it's tough to get there. <coughs> uh, but those of you that weren't there were there and a lot and, and sent some nice notes. And thank you so much for that. Um, it was a very good day again. This is year two of that. Now, this is a national event. This occurs on this day nationally across the nation. And it's just our opportunity to say thank you to our bus operators, both the paratransit and our fixed route and commuter bus operators for a job well done. Um, it's not meant to be exclusionary, to exclude other employees. Um, I, I, I really get Juan's point, and I appreciate that. I, I apologize publicly for whatever mix-up occurred where employees didn't realize they were invited, because we, tr we do try to invite all of our employees. Um, I respect his point about maybe we can find another day during the year in which we can come up with another one that sends more of a message of all employee appreciation. We'll talk about that, too. So uh, Juan, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Here's that message. Um, but this is, this is a really important day. And, and uh, you know, we think of our bus operators as going out there, hey, they get paid, they perform a service, um, the, so, so do the rest of our employees. But the, these are our frontline folks. These are our face of this agency. They represent this agency. They are, they are trained in customer service, and customer service on a daily basis, 8 to 10 hours a day, can be a challenge to be good at. We sometimes have customers that uh, work hard to pull our chain. Uh, I will tell you, when I was in uh, Washington um, just this last week, uh, on the news was a story about a bus operator. He had some unruly youth on his bus. And uh, they showed the video of this, by the way. But he had an unruly youth, and he said, you know, enough's enough. He pulled over. He said, you have to leave the bus. And so these students just gave him a lot of guff. And as, as they were walking out, one of them spit in the operator's face. The operator secured his bus, um, maybe not, not necessarily, I don't know whether he was following their rules or not, but he, he had some words with them, and one of them uh, grabbed uh, pepper spray and then proceeded to pepper spray him. Um, and so they have the video, they have the pictures of the individuals they're looking for them. That's an extreme example, uh, but our operators uh, do encounter things where people, uh, you know, unfortunately spit on them, say mean things to them. They, they can have a rough day. Um, and they deal with the best of the best, and they deal sometimes with the worst of the worst. And by the bus, and it's challenging for them to to do what they have to do, get through a day, and then on top of that, <coughs> be safe so that we drive those buses in a safe fashion, don't have collisions, uh, and deliver people safely to where they need to go. So their job is a hard job. They are the face of this agency, and I think it's pretty cool that nationwide transit properties across the nation on this day celebrate all that they do for us. So it's a special day. We'll look at the other, uh, the other issues brought up, too, and see what we can do. Um, you have in front of you uh, some notes from Barrow. Uh, this is some things that you requested. We also wanted to double back and let you know that Ms. Gomez uh, com comes to our meetings frequently, um, but she oftentimes repeats the same things that she has presented to us before. And we just want you to know, and you have a copy attached <coughs> to that, that we have responded to her. We have told her that we we took in all of her notes, and those things that we can identify as our, our unmet needs, if you will, go, are now added to an unmet needs list. We'll, we'll consider them against all our under, other unmet needs at a day and time in which we have more money to invest. Those things that were related to city infrastructure, county infrastructure, we have communicated those things to the cities and counties to make sure they take them on. So we try to do the best we can, even though she continues to come back, we try to do the best we can. And then there are some other questions in that document that you had asked, uh, and and we have answered. Also in front of you is a, a document. It's on the top. It's labeled uh, Attachment B. You'll also find it in 1006 B5 in your packet. Um, this actually directly results from a meeting that I had um, and my staff had with Director Chase uh, not too long ago. She asked a lot of questions about the various types of funding 
that we receive, and, and it just was a thought that you probably would like to know that information too. And so we, we took that little briefing with Director Chase and, and laid out all of the different funding sources, tried to help you understand um, which ones are fungible, that is, can be used for operations and capital, which ones are more limited. Um, this is a first cut. We'll try to refine this in the future, but it's a great document for you to keep in your packet for re referral at any given point, because we're always throwing these crazy numbers and names at you, 5339A, B, and C, uh, 5307, uh, um, low no grants, and bus and bus facility grants. It probably boggles your mind. And so that you'll have a cheat sheet now that you can, you can try to get some quick references on that. And it's good for you to know when there's fungibility, if that's how you can use that term, of the particular types of funds, that maybe you'll have an alternate thought and that you, you need to be given that information so that you don't necessarily take it for granted that what we say and what we recommend is the only way that it can be done. So it can be a, a good information for you. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Clifford, I, I just, uh, excuse me for interrupting, I think that would be a great thing to put on our website. Uh, people come to these meetings, they could, they could be familiar with what we're talking about, more familiar with what we're talking about, one of these acronyms we use or what it's for and so forth. They could be a real benefit to the general public too. I think it'd be a good idea to put it on our website. And I just want to uh, repeat um, my appreciation for you first putting this together and, and making it available for the board. This is something that I know I've mentioned before, like when we were working on Judy K. Souza, people really didn't understand that that money was intended for capital. It could be not be used for anything else. And they had a really hard time with that because they wanted us to be putting it into, you know, bus service and we couldn't. And this is just... This is helpful in terms of all the acronyms for us as a board and also the public, but I think it's also helpful for us and as well as the public to understand what the limitations are of the funding. So I just really appreciate you putting this together and making it available. Yep. Thank you for calling that to our attention. And thank you to Barrow and, and Tom in particular for putting those together. What item does it appear in? Sorry. It's in the packet. I like it's behind something else that's yeah. on your. Yeah. Okay. 10.06B. Could I, thank you. Could I also um, ask if we could indicate the funding and then whether it's restricted funding for that particular item or not? Because then we know whether funds are available that could be made adjustment for other, other items. Because some funds are very restrictive, and I don't know how much money we're talking about when I see this. So I'd like to see the dollar amount on this if we could. These are, uh, actually, these dollar amounts vary um, because some of them are formula and they're, they're tied to mm -hmm. federal appropriations, which is a topic I'm going to talk about in a little bit. <coughs> some are tied to sales tax. I mean, we can give you kind of ranges of some of those. Ranges would help or maybe what uh, percentage of, the, of our budget these items might be, especially the more significant ones. So that's a, that's a good question leading to another clarification to this to maybe break this down further into operations dedicated, capital dedicated, flexible kinds of dollars. Mm -hmm. We knew we would do another generation of that. That's I think. Thank you. Okay, continuing on, uh, on uh, the 5th of April, we're going to take a team of managers up to the FTA regional office. Um, we have a number of questions we need to discuss with them, but this is also to sort of do some pre-flight advanced background before we go with the board members to Washington, D.C. next month. No, we have uh, uh, a beautiful award for the NOLO grant to buy three electric over-the-road coaches, but uh, BYD is unable to perform to our performance standard, and we need to have a conversation with the FTA about what our next step is. Do we continue and hold the money there and wait for them to innovate and get the bus to perform as it's supposed to perform? Or can we move that money over to buy some other electric buses that are not over-the-road coaches? The problem here is over-the-road coaches um, have not been tried and tested. It's new technology. They got a first generation that just did not do well, and we're not going to buy something that doesn't do well. That's not how you handle the public's money. Um, but we need guidance from the FTA, and pre-flighting with the FTA, I think, will help us make a better argument to the federal office when we go next month. So I'll let you know more about that. Also, a couple of weeks ago, we took a team of folks out to Livermore and toured the beautiful new Gillig bus manufacturing plant. Um, that is just an absolutely impressive plant. We don't have Gilligs in our fleet right now, um, but if we get this award of our bus and bus facilities grant, which is supposed to have been announced um, 
any day now since September of last year. Um, <laughs> the FDA assured us that it's any day now when we were in Washington this week. We'll see if that holds true. Um, but we have nine buses in that grant that we would like to get awarded. Those are CNG buses in that particular grant. And uh, if we get that award, there is a possibility we'll want to maybe take advantage of some contract options that Gillig has. They are really building a quality product, and I think our team as a whole were impressed. Um, we spent most of a whole day out there touring the, the line and seeing how buses were built. Um, Tiger Grants, I sent you all some information about Tiger Grants, and uh, it's just bad news. We don't, we don't have a Tiger Grant. We'd kind of like to maybe have one in the future. Maybe if we figure out a plan to build our new, uh, rebuild the new uh, Pacific Transit uh, station or our paratransit, of course, we need to replace that too. Tiger Grant might be in our future. You have to have the shelf-ready project before you apply for it. What's distressing about this is even though we don't need it today, we hope this pattern doesn't continue in which you have $500 million of nationwide money and we ended up with a terrible, terrible uh, set of odds to try to compete against. We will be vigilant in that, and team, when we go to Washington, D.C. in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about that. Um, there was some good news that occurred while I was in uh, Washington, subject to, subject to um, Congress approving the current uh, omnibus appropriations bill and, of course, our president signing it. Um, but new money has been put in that will, will benefit us. Um, so funding in the bus and bus facilities program, growing that program, would increase $400 million. That, that is an incredible amount of money that begins to recoup what we lost in 2012 when Congress, uh, in the MAP-21 Act, took away a bunch of money from bus and bus facilities and moved it over the rail, gave it back to us only recently in the FAST Act, however, did not give us everything that they had taken away. This is not recurring money, this is one-time money, so you need to be mindful of that, but that still another 400 million in the bus and bus facilities program for the next round helps us all. The more money in there, the, the better. And this is a program, just like the LONO, that's oversubscribed at least 10 times in every, every round of grant funding. Formula money, um, they're gonna add an additional, they're, they're proposing, I should say, to add an additional 209 million to that um, now that has, I had Tom just do some extremely preliminary analysis of that, but that has the potential of yielding about another $200,000 for us. That's, that's, good. that's nearly enough to fund uh, two operators to adding additional service. It's enough to, to part of the way to, to funding a bus or it's good money for a grant towards a bus. So the options will be many if that money comes through. That's just our preliminary estimation. Again, it's <coughs> approving the omnibus bill. Um, competitive grant programs, another 161 million. That, I don't know where they'll drop that in yet, but that's really good news. And then Lono would get another 29.45, taking it up to 84, almost 84 and a half million dollars nationwide. Remember, that's the grant that we won a couple of years back. We apply for that grant every year, and that could be really good news. That. Um, and then finally, in closing, just thinking about what, what I learned in the last several days in Washington and how that, that dovetails into what we do uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm beginning to better refine where we would put our energy going forward. Um, certainly, stabilizing the Highway Trust Fund is going to be one of those keynotes. That's important because whenever the Highway Trust Fund is subject to all of these pay-for, subject to general fund money feeding it, it's at risk, especially in the Trump administration, it's at risk. So we need the Highway Trust Fund to be funded with stable, recurring forms of, of money, revenues. And if that happens, then, of course, transit being 20% of that, we become more stable, too, uh, in future reauthorizations and other kinds of programs that are funded through that. Um, finding stable sources for the FAST Act, same exact problem. FAST, FAST Act was put together at the last minute, you know, really decent program, had a small amount of growth, but the FAST Act is not built on stable, recurring sources. Our points. Uh, the big one that we'll focus on is the infrastructure bill. Trump's infrastructure bill is is absent in any discussion about transit whatsoever. And then he has he has decided that he thinks the the model should be flipped from sort of the traditional 80 percent, 20 percent feds, 80 percent local, 20 percent <coughs> to 20 percent feds, 80 percent local, 
that is just a no-starter. Every office that we visited in the last week said that's a no-starter, that just ain't happening. So I hope that that's the case. We'll speak to that when we go. But we need to get transit into the conversation, and right now the president does not pay attention to transit. <laughs> it's about a whole lot of other things, like, <laughs> like we heard about last year, broadband and dams and electrical distribution <laughs> systems. Um, but it's absent any discussion about us. And then last, what we'll talk about is we'll talk about the alternative fuels tax credit. That's a little over $600,000 for us. That's good money to match grants. We need that. It's a really crummy program the way they do it today where they, they're supposed to give, us, give it to us early in the year and then we're, we're subject to end of the year tax extenders. We hold our breath hoping every year it'll come through. And if we're lucky it comes through retroactive. Uh, but then on the day that they approve it is the day we should be getting the next allotment and we don't get that yet for another year. We need to fix that. That's what our agenda is looking like. It shapes up to the point where whatever changes I'll add to it. Just a uh, one half hour session, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> huh? I just I want to say a few things about the cooperation between the city and the, the district about uh, the Eco Pass. Uh, thank you for moving ahead on this. This is a win-win situation and it's, it's a great... Uh, um, example of a cooperative effort to solve a, a transportation issue that we have in this county and the city county as well. And the Appreciation Day, I, I, the, the concerns were well taken and thank you for mentioning that. And uh, I just want to point out that when we were going through some tough times a couple of years ago or just up to a year ago, uh, it was everybody got in the boat and started rowing in the, right, in the same direction. And uh, we couldn't have done it without everybody on board, literally. So I want to say how much I appreciate the employees throughout this organization and for what they did when we were going through some real tough times. It really helped us all and uh, we're going to get better and uh, we hope that uh, there's more to come uh, of good things in the future. Uh, Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple uh, pieces. One, I think the EcoPass could serve as a, uh, as a model as we think. Of, I know the city is doing it, the county is looking at uh, uh, corridor planning, you know, uh, we call it sustainable Santa Cruz uh, 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 county plan. But, you know, the idea that uh, as we look at these uh, increased densities along our transit corridors requiring uh, the purchase of bus passes uh, to help support the system and make us make real the idea that we want people to take transit instead of driving their cars um, may be something that we should take a look at. And uh, so I'll be curious to find out the details of the, of the plan and how it was done. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I just w want to uh, comment on is uh, two weeks ago I was in D.C. Uh, for the National Association of Counties Conference and uh, Secretary of Transportation uh, Elaine Chow spoke to the, to the group and she gave out the 60-page document about the infrastructure plan. She was the cabinet uh, officer to tell us about infrastructure. Um, and it was a, it was a nice 60-page uh, uh, document with lots of pictures, a little short on specifics. But she tried to um, uh, 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 tell us how great it was that they were that they were incentivizing uh, local development dollars by only giving us 20 percent of the money, and there were everybody at my table, and then we were from around the country. We did everything we could to, not to yell back at the stage. Uh, later in the afternoon, there was a um, uh, a session, a legislative session from NACO. And they said, well, the good news is we were one of the first to get the, this document, the 60-page document. And the other part of the good news about it is their infrastructure plan did not come to the, to the Congress as a bill. So the, what NACO was telling us is it's unlikely that any infrastructure bill will look like what the, what the uh, president wants because, you know, when you're dealing with people who have no experience in government, they don't they don't do the things that you ex that you would expect a presidential administration presented as a bill, so the legislature will end up um, crafting something. So hopefully it'll look much different um, than what the president has uh, has offered. I'm not sure it'll get done this year. I mean, th this uh, that with the passage of the of the budget document uh, this week, I think they they passed it last night in the uh, in the Senate. Uh, it's hard to believe that uh, before the end of March, they said that's the last piece of major legislation that will be accomplished this year in Congress. We should only work so hard. Uh, anyway, I, 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 I uh, support my colleagues going to D.C. and uh, want to acknowledge uh, uh, our uh, CEO uh, uh, for putting together this trip. Uh, I know last year it was helpful not to go during the 
uh, AFTA convention uh, because we were able to get in and see people and not be in conflict with the many other uh, transit properties who are also trying to see uh, the Department of Transportation, the FTA, and every, every, everything else. So I think it was wise. Um, uh, I saw it firsthand last year why that was a good idea. So good luck on the trip. Bring back some money. Yeah. Director Rodkin. I, I just wanted to say uh, about the uh, Eco Pass downtown. The, the speakers who, uh, from the public who supported it, I wanted to thank them for having done so. But uh, nobody uh, mentioned more explicitly what really the alternative is there. The, the parking district downtown in the city of Santa Cruz will either build a very large new garage or, or one or more new garages to handle people's parking needs down there at the cost of millions and millions of dollars, or they'll put the money into something like this EcoPass alternative. Doesn't mean there wouldn't be any new parking garages, but the scale of them and how many of them there are is directly affected by this. So, in terms of global warming or you know, greenhouse gas issues, you're either putting money into public transit and encouraging people not to take their cars, or you're deliberately encouraging them to take their car. Now, there's enough spaces for you to drive down here by yourself in your car. You can find a space that'll be great. So, you're going to move one direction or the other, and it really is more than just some people will have an incentive to get out of their cars. There won't be parking spaces for the people that are looking for them, and that's why they're going to need these passes. The two things go together. And what really happens is it frees up the parking spaces that customers need so that they'll be able to go shopping in downtown. Right now, most of the people that work in downtown take all those spaces up. So you're driving around in circles. You, you look sometime at the Trader Joe's uh, parking lot. People just driving around. And yesterday, middle of the day, driving around and around in circles, watching. I just stood there for a while, just watching it and stuff. They're, they literally it take them 10, 15 minutes to find a parking space. People fights going on. People, both of them waiting for the same space. And so this is a real alternative to that kind of stuff going on in our downtown. I really appreciate it. Director Duque. Thank you. I, I just wanted to comment on a couple things. One is. Um, I know Juan was outside of the room, but we, he spoke on the participation day or the um, appreciation day, and and that's something that um, definitely we want to make sure that you guys are you, everyone's appreciated. I know the city of Watsonville, we do a day for all of our departments, so hopefully that's something that I encourage that we continue to do. So um, he did say that we're gonna we, we're gonna find a day that works for everybody, so that we can appreciate everybody. So thank you for bringing that up. Also, um, I wanted to say that I also agree. I liked your idea of moving the over the the road the over the. Um, the hill b buses to just regular route buses, I think that that would, I mean, because I feel like we're waiting forever. I mean, I, I, we're going to be waiting longer than the Watsonville bus, you know, for those to get in. Sorry, Erin. <laughs> She's nodding her head. <laughs> um, but it, I, I don't know how um, feasible that is. If, have you already started that conversation? And um, if so, I think a good idea is when we do go to DC is we really to start working with our um, Silicon Valley representatives to maybe work with them to getting grants for those buses since it, it affects both of us, you know, um, going over the hill that we, maybe they can help us get funding for those buses um, when we eventually get them and maybe use these buses for, you know, Santa Cruz or Capitola or Scotts Valley. Okay. Um, it'll be a good conversation. We're, we're going to get our notes together on what our ask is and sort of prioritize that. But if, if the FTA were to say, um, no, you submitted a grant for over-the-road coaches, and if you don't buy over-the-road coaches, we'll take our money back, um, then, then we'll have a Gotta conversation <laughs> about how yeah. long can we keep that money waiting for the technology to improve. Now, the beauty, the beauty of sort of waiting a little while, if that is the default, is that MCI in 2020 is supposed to be producing an electric over-the-road coach, and uh, MCI has been in the over-the-road coach business for many, many years. That's, that's a fallback plan. I would rather, I mean, right now my leaning is the priority would, first priority be let us move the 3.2 million over the fixed route. We'll just buy some fixed routes. If they'll further let us um, move away from BYD into Proterra, we have Proterra options and we could get the buses, call it a day, and life is good. Um, on your other point, uh, Ciro is actively, has been for months tr uh, negotiating with VTA uh, to buy us some buses. We're trying to get five or six buses out of them through this partnership that we have. I wish I could be here today saying done deal, but he's still working aggressively on it. If you don't know this, if you haven't seen the articles about it, VTA has a, a massive structural deficit problem, uh, very similar on scale to what we had. And they're focused on that and less focused on us, but we're still pushing. 
Okay, that's what I like to hear. I mean, that's something that I, those those relationships, especially with BTA, is is important. So, um, but I think that when, as soon as you get that letter out, just let us know because I think it's important um, to see if we can move those over and maybe they can do a ribbon cutting for Santa Cruz getting their first electric bus or Scotts Valley, you know, so these routes. And my final thing is, um, you, you you talked about Tiger Grants earlier, and if if I'm from my understanding, I thought Tiger Grants were mainly um, for like economically disadvantaged communities. Uh, am I wrong on that, or because that was what you were saying, you know, downtown Santa Cruz or um, the Para, Para Cruz um, building, which I don't find are in areas that are probably disadvantaged. Well, they're pretty flexible. Tiger grants uh, can be, I mean, your grant application can be assisted by things like disadvantaged communities. The disadvantaged community really comes into play more on the state level, um, like the LC Top grants that we go after. That's, that's where it weighs heavy into that. Um, but Tiger, here's the thing about Tiger. You, you can't go for that grant um, if you have a, a qualifying project until you get it shelf ready. So shelf ready means we've got to get through all of the processes of design and environmental to get it ready to go. So that if they award the money, you can say, I'm going to build it within a certain limited time period. But we do have projects like Pacific Station, like what we'd like to do at Paracruz, that could be potentials. But we have to know what we want to do, and then we have to do a lot of expenditures in advance of that to get it ready, shelf ready. Right, which the, we, the, we just don't have the funding to do that, though. I mean, if, if that's been my conversation over the last three years sitting here. So that's going to be a rough one. So, okay, thank you. Councilman Gomez. Yes, thank you. Um, the Eagle Pass makes a lot of sense, and I think that when we really look at the business model and what kind of increase that we're getting on the ridership from our downtown, to use that business model to go after some of the larger employers or and or employers where um, their employees are going over 17 and seeing if there's a possible incentive that maybe those employers can attract more employees from this side of the hill to the, those businesses that they go to to work um, that are now getting some of them, but maybe not nearly as many as um, could be the potential or uh, the larger employers maybe even, uh, for example, um, I'll use a boardwalk just as a, a basic, em employees that need to get to the bus, uh, need to get to the boardwalk for work, um, being able to have a conversation with them to see if that's feasible too. I don't know demographically yet where people are coming and going uh, on that. so. We, we may be able to have more data or the Metro has more data than where I'm coming from at this point, but business model is important. Uh, and I think also attracting and incentivizing some of these other larger employers will be very beneficial for that. And the uh, when it comes to the employee appreciation, and I don't know if it was used, but it, maybe when the, the payroll checks go out with the notification of an email that something's put in there. I, and I know that people just go in autopilot sometimes even with emails, but doing some sort of a blast that most people are really wanting, most staff will want to open up the email when it's coming from you know, a, a payroll service or a, a CEO, com something like that, so that we're getting a bit more um, email opened um, messages so that we don't have an issue with people not being informed of the invitation might be helpful. So we already do have a uh, relationship with the boardwalk and they do provide funding to support a late night bus to take their employees back to Watsonville. Director Matthews. I just wanted to let um, the board members know that the EcoPass discussion is part of a much broader discussion on transportation demand management for specifically for the downtown parking district right now. And there is a very detailed report that will be coming to council. Is it April? Is that when they're shooting? Yeah. And we actually should let you know about that. Um, we will be losing several significant lots uh, in downtown Santa Cruz. Um, Calvary Church lot will be building some housing in the relatively near future. There's um, our downtown plan has been um, accepted by council and approved by Coastal. So we're anticipating in the relatively foreseeable future, some real significant density, some new construction downtown. So um, it's a very exciting time and the um, parking needs uh, can be, um, I think will probably be increasing, but should also be offset. And there's some very, very good work going into the bigger picture of transportation demand management, which includes cycling, et cetera. Um, person transportation planner working on this is Claire Fleisler, who used to work for Metro. So it's a good discussion. Um, and I think, think as Alex said, um, it's, it's still an active discussion. Is that a, an accurate <laughs> um, 
uh, comments. So um, I think when that discussion is planned, we should we should just let the uh, other board members know um, because that's be a, a big piece of it. Good item to pr when yeah. you're ready and it's said yeah. and done, you have a package together to present it or somebody present it yeah. for the city. Mm -hmm. be good. Director Lynn. Yeah, and I echo everyone else's comments on the Eco uh, Pass Pilot Program. That definitely sounds like an exciting. Thank you for, for all of your work on that. But I was, um, when uh, Commissioner Dutra mentioned engaging with Silicon Valley, I was thinking uh, many of us I know are members of the Sil Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and that may be another resource before the Washington trip to reach out to and, and get you know work and support for this area with Silicon Valley and Santa Cruz County. So maybe, and if you need contact information, I know I have that, so that, that may be a, a resource for support. Yes, sir. I just want to add to that. That's a great idea. And um, the City of Santa Cruz Economic Development is also connected mm -hmm. with Silicon Valley groups. And as I'm sure you know, Casey Byer is very right. well connected. So um, that's a good idea. Casey Byer of the Santa Cruz Chamber of Chamber, Commerce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, there's been a lot uh, discussed here. Is anybody from the public would like to discuss any of these items that we've just mentioned? Yes. I just wanted to uh, commend the mention of Gillick buses uh, in that uh, oral report. I know that AC Transit is a big customer of theirs, and in my experience of riding their new Gillick buses that they offer, they seem to work well. Some of them are even quieter than the normal CNGs that we're used to hearing, and I think that would be a great addition to consider to the Metro fleet. Um, I do hope that we do see more electric buses rolling in though as time and time progresses. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, and I uh, also just wanted to wish the uh, board luck on their DC journey. Thank you. Good, thank you very much. Um, anyway else in the public would like to comment on any of the items that were mentioned here? Oral report. We need a motion to. Uh, no. I guess we need a motion. Is, is, has somebody made a motion on this yet? Oh, we no, had no, it's yet. just an oral report. Just a report. Just a report. Okay, we'll move to um, uh, accept uh, the uh, the year to date monthly financial report from Angela Aiken, finance manager. Good morning. Follow along in your board package, you can go to 1331. This report is for uh, month ending December 31st. Our revenues were $492,000 uh, over budget, which is wonderful. Total operating expense for $242 under, which makes us $734 ahead for the month of December. Year to date, we're about a, a million nine ahead. Our uh, revenues are around $800,000 and our expenses are around a million two. Uh, the next page here, it shows you the budget versus the actual. Our ridership is down as we have been uh, discussing. You can see that in the passenger fare numbers. Our sales tax is up. So um, this is through the month of December. I just got the information through um, March. It, and March is our true up where the um, state goes through and makes sure this is what we give. Every other month it's uh, estimated. I guess I'm done. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <You're> done. <laughs> Next. We're going to end on the good news. <laughs> good news. We're done. Move on we well. spent a lot of time on the oral report from the CEO. <laughs> so we're going to just rush you. We have money. That's all we have to know. Yeah, we have money. That's all I need to say. Um, let's see, what else we got? Oh, so, sorry. Year to date, we are 4.5% above the last year. 
So that's, that's just basically the bottom line of what we're doing here. Um, actual last year receipts versus actual this year receipts were about 4.5% ahead of, of schedule. We only budgeted two and a half, uh, but I am seeing a slowdown too, just so that's out there. We've been uh, tracking at about five-ish, a little over five, and now we're tracking about four and a half. So things are starting to stable and slow down just a little bit on the ground. Um, here's the differences on the passenger pair, shows you the $240,000. $800,000 on the sales tax because we have been so far uh, in the first six months of the year, $800,000 above. Uh, we have ads and investments coming in a little, or ads and interest coming in a little bit uh, higher than we thought budget wise. Uh, UCSC has been contributing to our other um, operating assistance with the $27,000 with the uh, kids' buses. They've been helping us with that. And then on the uh, $172,000, that's the STA money that comes in that we have dedicated to moving over to capital for um, capital projects, but it hits our operating uh, budget first. So that money did come in, we'll be moving that to capital. Today expenses, here's the budget versus actual. We're doing pretty good there. Our actuals are pretty much below what we are budgeted. Here's the details to that. The first two, first three bars, the two blues and the one red, you take those all together. And uh, favorable advances on the labor is due to your vacant positions that we have and extended unpaid leaves. Countering that, we've had to fill those positions with overtime, and that's where the $630,000 comes in. Additionally, we have had um, lower medical uh, expenses than we thought we were going to have. And uh, because of the uh, consistency that we've had in looking into our workers' comp cases, we've been able to bring those expenses down from what we budgeted last year. Professional technical fees, we have some contracts that we haven't entered into yet, but we will be getting into those for the rest of the year, so we have a favorable variance right now. Um, mobile supplies, so it's tire and fuel. Um, I will tell you it's going to be showing negative next time, so they, they buy in lots every few months, not every month. So we're positive right now, but it will be going negative at the next month. And then the settlement costs, that's just a factor out there. We have not had uh, settlement costs in to what we thought so far this year, which is a good thing but that, that uh, favorable variance could be wiped out at any time. Questions on the operating side of this? Director Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. On item 14A4, um, can you give me an idea of, because you're saying that we're up a little bit, uh, what would it be seasonally at the same time from year to year? Because I would imagine that there's some fluctuation um, of expenditures that aren't you know, every single month at the same amount, maybe some parts of the year there's higher amounts. So what would this look like relative year over year of the same period of time? For the revenues, is this the page you're uh, looking at? 14.4, yes, I believe so. Operating revenues. Mm -hmm. So for our revenues, it depends on the revenue. Some of the revenues we straight line for 12 months. Some of the revenues, uh, we know when the money's going to come in from certain grants, like the FTA, we know exactly when that's come, when those uh, right. allotments of money are coming in. Um, I'm going to say that the money that's coming in right now is um, consistent with what you would see on a year-to-year -year basis. We haven't had any huge anomalies of, of money being withheld or money being dumped in sooner than we thought it was going to be put in. The variances that you're seeing here are the first two um, explicitly. The ridership is down from mm -hmm. what we budgeted. That's my explanation of why uh, the revenues are what they are. Are they slower or higher than they were last year? I think it's about the same. About the same. Uh, same, same scenario with the sales tax. The sales tax comes in every month. And mm -hmm. so uh, the sales tax that's come in so far for the first six months of, of the year, we've gotten $800,000 more than what we budgeted. We budgeted 2.5%. We're running about 4% right now. Good, because I, I just wanted to make sure that you know, some some things are our grant money that comes in and uh, it blips in terms of what it looks like on year to date that, that is either more positive, even though it's supposed to be all the money coming in and then it stretch outs for the rest of the year. And I just want to make sure what I'm comparing apples to apples with. So you would see it on this slide, that 172, that is a blip and that will be removed over to the capital budget next time. It comes into our operating money, but the board has made a directive decision that we take that money and we move it to capital to a certain um, dollar amount. Uh, Norm, uh, Mr. Hagan. Yeah, uh, Angela, on slides two, three, five, six, seven, and 12, you have <coughs> labor overtime, 
I, my question is how much of this overtime is because we lack more permanent positions? And if this is so, shouldn't we be working to fill these positions to eliminate this overtime? So we um, I'm gonna focus on bus operators. We have multiple positions that are vacant right now, but I'll focus on the bus operator position. Normally in positions you have a vacancy, you go out for a recruitment, takes 30 days. You go through the recruit, uh, in interview process, the testing process, that's another 30 days. So a normal position would be open about 90 days. With the bus operators, we can't do one-offs. We have to have a class. And so we keep track of when uh, people leave, retire, whatever reason that they're no longer employed. And we come up to a number. I believe the number right now is six or seven. And then we recruit. And that goes through the 90-day process. And then you have 12 weeks, I believe 12 weeks, of training of those individuals. So you've got quite a big span before you're able to put that person into service or, or hire that person on. Um, the overtime has to cover that whole period of time from when that person leaves to when that person is actually on route by themselves, um, including the training process and the, and the recruitment process. So you have a pretty big window that we have to cover all of the shifts that this one person is now going to cover with the overtime. So that's the biggest part of the overtime. We do have overtime customer service. I have a vacancy, three vacancies right now for sure. Um, I know we have some other vacancies that the HR manager can talk to if you want to know all of the vacancies that we have. Thank you. I'm just concerned that we have positions leaving to overtime. I, I know the board members all know the answer to this, but the public watching on TV don't. Could you tell us what are we doing with this money? We have one, you know, a surplus, it looks like right now. We're doing pretty well. We're, we're, do, we're spending less than we thought we would, and we're getting more in than we thought we would. But why don't we run out there right now and put, create six new routes and serve all the, you know, do all the things people like to do? What are we, what are we doing with this money? So the budget is created on um, full complement. So if we have 320 positions today, we budget 320 positions. Um, it would not be fiscally responsible of me to only budget 300 positions because historically we have 10 to 15 that are open on a 12 month period of time. So we fully budget for the 320 odd positions. During the course of business over that 12 month period of time, we have people leave, positions are vacated for whatever reasons. So that's where some of the savings comes from, but we have overtime that, that eats away at that a little bit. Additionally, we have um, material, uh, non-personnel costs, fuel, um, parts, uh, painting a bus, engine replacements, things like that. Um, if it is an operating expense, then we want to budget that our, our fleet that is, um, is waning right now, we have more repairs that we're anticipating. Sometimes we don't have all those repairs. So what you're seeing right now is um, our need to make sure that we're covered just in case. And what you're saying is we're being very diligent about spending our money. Our uh, equipment and our people are hanging in there and, and doing the jobs that we need done. So we're able to save money, not spend as much as we anticipated we might have to. The uh, million dollars or the almost two million dollars that I'm showing you today is six months in, that does not mean that we have money to go out and get routes. That does mean that we have the ability to take this money and do thing, give you op options of what the board would like us to do. Our reserves are not fully funded. We do have service that might have to be put out there better than it is today. We have positions uh, that have not been funded for a very long time or positions that we've never funded. Um, we've... Uh, there's just all kinds of opportunities that we're going to be coming back to you later and saying, here's the anticipated money that we think we're going to have, one-time shot, it's not recurring money. Here's the things that we think uh, the board should consider spending this money on. And that's something that uh, Alex and I will bring forward to you probably in a few months. But no, it's not something to go out and put uh, a brand new route on the street or some, some kind of recurring expense in place because this is a one-year deal. It's not going to be there every year. Yeah, Director Rothwell. Well, there's also the issue of whether they're going to take that gas tax away I on the get state to level. That. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to have a reserve just in case something like that happens. And in terms of the polls right now, it looks like that if it gets on the ballot, they may in fact 
to be successful. I, I did forget that. You're right. That that's actually a huge risk. That's a huge risk above and beyond everything I just said. On the operating side. Sure, if I yes. could just jump in on sure. on uh, Norm's question a little bit too. If you if you look at 14A3, <coughs> look at a number like the overtime being at 633,000 uh, over budget. What you want to do is is in order to evaluate what that might mean, you want to look at two other numbers. You want to look at your labor regular, which is favorable, and your your fringe benefits regular. So in a, in a when when things are working out uh, nice, those two numbers, the labor regular un, under budget run favorable and fringe favorable, will be at or more than running your overtime. That's that's just sort of a little check that you can, and and if if you will, when you're talking about vacancies, it's obvious if you don't have people here, you're underrunning your fringe benefits. So that kind of a balance, like you see there, is a, is a, is a good thing. Well, and uh, sorry, and and on the overtime, obviously the uh, the mechanics and having to send people out when buses break down because of that situation with so many buses that need replacing, I'm sure that's heavily contributing to the overtime as well, and something we can't anticipate at at this point. So. That overtime number is all employees, not just buses. Okay. They are a significant number of that, but it is all employees overtime. I have overtime plus employees. Sure, but but we're adding more when we have the need for new buses. So. Director Kaufman Gomez. Yes, um, you had brought up the reserves are not fully funded, and from this packet, I didn't see anything about the the reserves. Is now a good time to ask the question of what is our goal to make sure that we're meeting the needs of what we're supposed to fully fund for our reserves? So we have a board policy out there on reserves, and that's something that we can discuss further mm -hmm. with you at our, at okay. our meeting. Okay, um, that's fine. We have a three-year uh, goal and a five-year goal, and so um, I can walk through those details, but that was presented to the board. They approved it, and we're okay. trying to walk down that road. All right, we'll, we'll discuss a bit more later. Thank you. On the capital, so this is the capital budget. This is the kind of funding we have. We had twenty million dollars in funding, of which uh, through the end of December we spent almost a million dollars. Move on to the the uh, what we have spent that funding on. I want to refer you to page fourteen B one. <clears throat> this is a new um, piece of the report that we've put in here, and it directly corresponds to this chart that I have in front of you on fourteen A nine. Um, 14A9 shows you the buckets that we are uh, spending, uh, construction-related projects, the IT projects, revenue vehicle replacements, non-revenue, and then we have miscellaneous. 14B1 shows you all the details of exactly what is uh, budgeted in those particular buckets, how much has been spent in those buckets, who's responsible, and uh, the kind of funding. As And on the very right side, there's something called grant expiration date. So that kind of tells you how fast and what kind of money we have to spend. If you want me to go into the detail of that, I can. Otherwise, we can. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> so additional information. Our unemployment rate is a little lower than it was a year ago. At uh, 6.5 versus 7.5. The gas is much higher. A year ago it was 2.74 and it was 3.16. The ridership for the total ridership, a little bit um, lower than it was a year ago. That's the blue line up there. And um, our local ridership is slightly higher than it was last year. Um, Highway 17 and Cambrio, they, as you can see there, they are about the same. The last piece is uh, our operating expenses. This is our preliminary look as of the end of February. Uh, we're thinking our expenses are going to be about a million six uh, under budget, which is great. Uh, it's, from what I can see here, it's about a 62% personnel and 38% uh, non-personnel savings on this side. Questions? Oh, wait, i got to keep going. Sorry. <laughs> Uncontrollable budget risks. 
this is our SB1 slide. And uh, the numbers are, are a little bit changed from what I showed you before. It's still a million two each year, a million two and 18, a million eight and 19 for the TDA STA in our operating side. So that's, uh, um, that's the risk, having that million nine to the good right now. We'd actually be close to zero if, if this happens. And then on the capital side, those numbers have slightly changed. They used to be um, about $737,000, and the uh, State Controller Office has amended those numbers and brought them down to six hundred twenty. So it's about a $2.2 million risk right now for this year and two points, almost two point eight next year. And from what I'm also reading, it's becoming very expensive. Now, any questions? Any other questions from the board? Uh, questions from the uh, public? Any questions you might have? Move we accept the report and thank Angela for so clearly pointing out what's going on. Thank you. Just a question. Someone please explain to me what's going on, because because I thought I heard at the last board meeting that that ridership was up. Okay, thank you. That's all I have to say. Uh, other questions? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Becky, thanks for the question. Um, that report was through December. Um, my, my comments last month on ridership went a little farther into time, and things are picking up slightly in the ridership world, depending on which of the categories of ridership you're talking about, local, UCSC, or Highway 17. So it ebbs and flows month to month. You see, uh, as right, UCSC is up. Uh, uh, let's say UCSC is up 10, 15 percent, again, depending on the month. Overall, we're flat to 1 percent loss gain, depending on month. UCSC is up strongly. Highway 17 is down about 5 percent, so that leaves the rest of the local service down 1 to 2 percent. It nets out. We're hanging in there barely at flat. As I told you last month, the national trend of down the fact that we have, as I included in your note today, 50% of our ridership is from a university that is growing in its <coughs> demand. That's helping to spend off the national trend of downward ridership. Is Cabrillo flat? Uh, Cabrillo is up, I'm going to miss the percentage, 6%. I, I need to check that. Up 6%. Over last last year was two hundred and seventy thousand. This pr is projected to be a little over three hundred thousand. So I got to do the math of that real quick. Again, with the colleges, month to month is a really tricky. It's always nice to reconcile that for you at the end of the the school year, much like our fiscal year. Questions? Mike, can you? I'll buy a motion. No, she has. Do you have a question? I, I, and this may not be the right place, but you can figure out where to put it. Um, I'm just wondering where to get a, um, a status report on the UC um, student fee measure. So w because that's a big part of the budget going forward. I, I, and I don't know if this is the right place. So well, yeah. the financial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. It, it is yeah. Fine. Yeah. We can yeah. fit almost anything under financial. Give, <laughs> this is Larry Pegler. I could give a very brief synopsis. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've received the uh, sponsorship from the Student Union Assembly and from the graduate dean, which allows us to put the measure on the ballot in June. I'm submitting the final paperwork for that by the end of today. And then we will, once that's on the, the ballot, we'll begin our campaign program. It's under and if yeah. I Go could ahead. just follow up on that, we had a, a good initial meeting, I think. And um, is there anything you can use from us? I know it's a, only the students are voting, and there are some students interested in this. Is there anything you can use from us to I'll support that? I'll be back that? in touch with you. I know at the last board meeting, uh, I believe there was an agreement from the board to split the funding of some 
decals that will go on to the windows of the articulated buses. We see that as a sort of <coughs> campaign promo for those vehicles. Um, but we'll be putting the rest of this together and I'll be in touch with staff about opportunities to support it. And um, uh, board member Rotkin may have some students. We'll be on this. We'll be <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in touch with all the usual suspects. Thank you. We'll be and on thank this you, like white on rice. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pegler. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Pegler, for your, your work on this, too. Any other I'll questions from the board? Right from the, I have a motion, motion from Mr. Rodkin. Second. Second. Uh, motion second. Uh, all those in favor to accept the financial report? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, item number 15 is our um, strategic business plan update. This is about. Go ahead. Good morning, Chair, Board members, staff, and public, and particularly welcome to Director Kaufman Gomez. Um, I know the rest of you know who I am. I'm Barrow Emerson. I'm the manager of planning and development. I've seen you over time. And by the way, before I start into this item, <coughs> I feel a bit sheepish about all the good comments I got from the citizens about the Transportation Justice Conference because Eduardo Montesino and I actually tag teamed that event. So all, sh all share of the credit to Eduardo. We, uh, we presented to the group of well over 100 people for almost an hour. So it was a very productive session. But thanks, Eduardo. All right, back on topic. Uh, real quick uh, verbal update on the strategic business plan. In terms of the schedule, the strategic business plan exercise, we want to start it with a board retreat. And for a variety of reasons, we think the best time to try to propose that is the late August, early September time frame. So we'll be checking your calendars and it may relate to this discussion of freezing Fridays for committees. But we'd like to start that off. And, 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 and you all know what a strategic business plan is. We try to paint you a picture of the longer term financial realities. Maybe a 10 year picture is, is what is used in most of these. And that'll, and, and you know, we'll identify the key risk. Uh, you know, we've discussed things like SB1, whether the CTC is going to allocate us the levels of money this year for some of the things we need. So by then we'll know whether those happened. The 62 bus issue is our number one issue out in front of us. Uh, fair restructuring will be part of the context. And the Paracruise facility and realities like that so will be part of it. But really what happens in a strategic business plan is we prevent you, present you with some alternative financial futures which makes you all consider some policy issues and some priorities. So look to see that process kicking off. It's a multi-month process, but it starts with a board retreat. So look for that coming at you pretty soon. Any questions on that topic? So it's just a short update. Okay, um, the, uh, the fair restructuring, uh, you know, item number 16, um, the hold in abeyance, I think we're going to just have to basically wait until after November, but uh, do you want to go ahead and make a presentation on that as well? Yeah, I mean, you, I could probably stop right there. You've sort of summarized the issue, but I feel obligated to share some of the details for the wider audience. I'm here to ask you to hold in abeyance consideration of this issue until late. 2018. At our March 12th Finance Standing Committee, we presented this topic. They endorsed uh, this position and told us to bring it to you today. As you know, for the last few months, staff has been conducting preliminary analysis of the financial impact of a fair restructure, including both new revenues that are possible, but also costs that come along with it. Also under consideration have been opportunities for improvement to the fair technology for payment which can both improve metro operating efficiency and provide additional customer convenience. As staff has established some general understanding of the possible revenue and cost impacts, these forecasts are relatively inexact because of possible variability in the number of factors, including exactly how much ridership would you lose if the fare went up 12%. We have a good understanding through the industry of that. But we have very few discretionary <coughs> writers in our system, so it's a bit of an, an inexact science. We've warned you about the national trend of shrinking ridership. That could be a background of this whole issue. Also, the revenue impact of various potential fair discount scenarios, which we were proposing could help offset these costs to many of our non-UCSC and Cabrillo writers, various higher discounts on various passes, et cetera. 
that's a pretty inexact science. Um, the costs associated with introducing new fare payment technology. As I noted previously, Metro is looking to release a request for proposals soon to learn more accurately how these improvements could cost in both their initial capital outlay, but their possible ongoing operating costs. Is someone going to charge us a penny a transaction, 5% a transaction? Is that more or less if we do more up front? So that we're going to get a lot clearer picture before we come back and start this process up again. So before we offer you a final restructuring proposal, Patrick, we also need to understand more accurately our actual revenue needs over the next few years. There are a number of significant financial issues in flux at the moment. I won't go into detail, but SB1 is at the heart of it. And, um, and remember that we always balance our budget, but we sometimes do that at the expense of spending some money we'd like to spend on capital issues. We have to balance our operating budget, so there's more <coughs> or less left to chase these things, and SB1 is at the heart of that. As Larry just said, the outcome of the UCSC election is very important to us. I won't go on with that. Also, Cabrillo College is dealing with enrollment fluctuations at the moment. So that affects their ability to either make their current commitments or grow in their commitment to their bus program. And lastly, the background to all this will be the adoption in June of the next two years annual budget and the five-year plan that goes along with it. So, um, In addition to this, we, we'd like to get away from the reactionary thing of every few years, oh my goodness, we don't have enough money, maybe we mm -hmm. need to increase fares. Uh, what we'd like to do is establish a fare policy which includes triggers for fare increases rather than just when all of a sudden we need some money. We envision establishing operational performance benchmarks based on the requirements of our various funding providers. I've told you before about the requirement to maintain a 20% fare box recovery ratio. Um, among these benchmarks could be that topic, it could be subsidy per passioner once it starts to climb above a percentage. We also have to watch CPI growth. So in terms of the outreach, you know that we just recently completed an initial cycle of informal public meetings to share the concepts of fare increases, specific cost savings ideas, and we discussed the fare technology with them. If the board approves today's staff recommendations, staff will hold in advance the previously performed uh, proposed formal public meetings that were scheduled for April. We'll hold all that ent until such time as we progress with this process again. However, staff is continuing its research into the revenue needs, the fair technology issues. We're working with not only the public, but our customer service staff and our operators on that, the whole issue of fair payment and the realities of what goes down every day out in the field. Um, also, the creation of a fair policy, which could include the triggers, which would identify when we need the additional revenue. So with the board's approval, staff would return at a later date when the variables noted above are resolved to determine the road forward on this issue. That completes my presentation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, any questions from the public? Yes, sir. see so uh, first question uh, with the new f or with uh, holding this if this abeyance is held um, will there be upcoming outreach meetings like there were initially for the fair restructuring um, since I'm sure the it'll be a diff there will be a different uh, outcome or a different set of variables being presented to the public by then um, if there will be one of those or another set of those meetings because I wasn't able to make it to those um, to provide my two cents. And also when it comes to the topic of payments, um, we might want to also look at our, or they might want to also look at our current ticket vending machines. I've noticed that there are uh, occasions where I go to the Metro Center downtown and the TVM would not be working and there's no, customer service booth because it's after six so also worth keeping in mind um, but yeah okay thank you comments from the board then any other comments from the public 
you have a comment? I, I guess the comment to the motion is that it makes sense. Let's not do anything that we're going to have to vote on until we have all of the facts in order. Sure. I second okay. that. Uh, Director Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we had a good discussion at the Finance and Budget Committee uh, about this, trying to figure out uh, uh, timing on it. And I appreciate the work of the staff. I think it does make sense to, uh, to, to hold off on, on this. And so um, uh, I would make the motion uh, uh, to hold this in abeyance uh, until late uh, 2018. Second. Second by Director Lynch. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Ms. Rockin. No, and mine uh, echoing and agreeing with what uh, uh, Director Leopold and I know Cynthia, mm -hmm. uh, we all three felt this was wise, and, and uh, so I would second that motion, but I know there may be discussion. So to answer the question from the member of the public, I, we won't be holding, I don't think, any informal a, a renewal of informal <coughs> meetings at this point, but when we come closer to this and know more, we'll start to hold those meetings again. But in the meantime, if you have input that you weren't able to give because you couldn't go to those, uh, those initial meetings, nothing stops you from sending us an email now and to have the staff consider your thoughts about the issue. Good comment. We have a motion and a second to um, have this... Uh, just delayed uh, the reconsider their consideration. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Maybe the only motion this year with the word abeyance in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we need consideration of issuing formal invitation for bids for roof and window replacement at the Pacific Station. Uh, Aaron Alvey, uh, purchasing manager. Morning, director. Okay. Um, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to. to almost read the first paragraph of the discussion in verbatim, but I believe this is a really good summary of the past actions. Um, so this item was brought to the board in February at our uh, meeting in Watsonville. And after some discussion, the item was tabled so that it could go to the Capital Projects Standing Committee with the understanding that the committee would present its recommendation for action to the full board here today. Um, the issue centers on the requested use of PTM ISEA, which is Public Modernization Improvement Service and Enhancement Account Program uh, from the state of California. And um, so the Capital Project Standing Committee met on March 15th. Um, Alex Clifford, our CEO, uh, gave a report on the history of these funds and how they were parked and allocated and moved throughout uh, a few different projects and um, local matches for grants throughout the history. Uh, this is a fiscal year 15 allocation of these funds, so uh, we've been using them for a while. Um, so we had a great discussion at, uh, with the committee, and the committee approved the staff's recommended action and referred the item back to the full board for discussion and action today. So let me take you through just a couple quick points. Uh, what this item is, is we're requesting to go out to bid to replace the entire roof at Pacific Station. It's about 20 years old. We've patched it several times. Um, it's leaking. The ceiling tiles uh, have stains, fresh stains every time it rains. So this, this is definitely in, um, needs to be taken care of. Uh, several of the windows in the building also leak um, quite severely uh, every time it rains. Um, right? <laughs> <laughs> I kept saying, we're, coming, we're going back to the board, just hold on. These windows are so bad they leak when it's not raining. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how we can solve our water problem. <laughs> that's right. Huh. Well, unfortunately, they're also leaking into the structure. Um, so we have tried to anticipate some costs for unforeseen repairs that are going to be in the framing and such. Um, but obviously there's a risk once you open that up that there could be more damage in there. Um, so the $350,000 we are asking for has some uh, funding uh, in there, but um, should there be more extensive damage, we'll come back to the board and let you know and, and tell you how much more money we might need to complete the project. Um, so another part of this, uh, going back to the PTM ISEA, is we're currently under discussions with uh, uh, the, uh, under, we're in discussions with the city of Santa Cruz um, to possibly reconfigure or have some new project with, with the Pacific Station where it's, where it's at or, or an unknown. Um, the city uh, uh, attended the Watsonville 
meeting and also the subcommittee meeting, and I, I think we had some good discussions with them. Um, part of our uh, part of the issue as well is that PTMISDA is uh, a restricted type of funding. Um, you cannot use it for the planning and environmental phases of a project. Um, so that's where we're at with that. Um, we are in planning, and next would be environmental. Um, and we know that that's uh, going to be quite an extensive uh, phase of the project at that site. It's, it's known <coughs> to be contaminated. So, um, so these funds can't be used for that. Um, so we are asking that we can uh, please use the funds. We believe we're going to use the transit center for at least three to five years, no matter what we come up with the city. Um, so staff is strongly recommending the approval of this item so we can have these repairs done and have a, a safe um, working environment for our staff and for the public to conduct business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You got questions from the board. Sorry, I don't mean to be too active to keep this going on any longer. Um, you said contaminated. Uh, what? Can you elaborate a little bit more about what you meant sure. by that? So the, this, this strip of Pacific Avenue that the Pacific uh, Station Transit Center is on um, was a, 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 were car dealers, repair shops back in the 60s. Okay. And so there's some gasoline and oil contaminants in the soil. It was also a TG&E transfer station at one point. So um, we purchased the land next to it, which was the Greyhound property, and we had to remediate that property. So we, we took uh, about three feet of soil out and had to cap it. Um, and we know those conditions exist on the other part of the property where we're operating the transit center. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions from board members? Questions from the public? You know, um, one, of, uh, one of the things that uh, I encourage you to do, well, it's in, in favor of, but you also need to look at the surroundings ever since Mr. Clifford has arrived. He's done, you know, painting, some carpet, and some improvements there, but we keep doing piecemeals. And piecemeals, we're still going to live there. Even whatever the conversation sends up with the city, we're still living there. Um, uh, when there needs to be investment in the bathrooms. Both the public bathrooms are the, are the you know, the... They, they're the, probably the worst bathroom in the county because they get the uh, readily used because they're open to the public. So um, it, it needs to be considered some other items in there too. Thank you. Just a simple question. Um, what happened to the Reimagine Pacific Station campaign hosted in, I think it was around 2014? But yeah, just wanted to see what that happened to that. I can speak to it, or you want to? Is that the last question? Another, any other questions? You can go ahead. Um, Director Matthews, do you want to just? I'll, I'll just say that 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 topic is in active discussion right now. Uh, it's morphed from the earlier discussions, but. Um, we do have a study in process now that's very much related to that. that that's, that's a quick summary. Mr. Clifford? Sure, just, just to tag on to that, the, the, um, the reimagining thing that we did uh, where we were out on Pacific Avenue and talking to people about what could be and getting public feedback on that, that was a part of that, that Group 4 project uh, that we alluded to in a report that you have in your packet today. And at the end of that pro that particular stage of this ongoing process, um, it was determined that the <coughs> Group 4 was not going to be a fundable project. Over a $100 million project that involved the transit center down below, and commercial and retail and, uh, and housing, and over 200 municipal parking spaces. Um, but at the end of the day, the cost was too prohibitive. And of that being 20 to 30 million was just not attainable. And so then it moved on to, as, as you just announced, sessions which are ongoing. Director Chase. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll let Dr. Matthews okay. speak first and then. Um, I'll just say that the um, reconfiguring of the Metro Pacific Station is part of a much larger package of projects uh, that are kind of converging for downtown in a 
in a short horizon, short-ish horizon. Um, and I'd be interested to get your name and contact info because uh, there's a lot of interrelated things that are happening having to do with housing, library, farmer's market, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, it's an exciting time <laughs> and it's an active process right now. Go ahead. Um, Director so Chase. So um, I want to sort of comment on a lot of the comments that have been happening here. And so this item is back to us today because um, part of the Capitol Committee was really looking mm -hmm. at different you know, Pacific station in specific, but also other capital needs. And uh, I we met last week and approved this to come back. And, and I think in the larger context, what we're looking at is what do we as a board want to do with the Pacific Station, which is why we have these, you know, two studies happening that the board supported, I believe, unanimously. Um, and I think that's really the point where the board's going to have to figure out what do we do, sort of in response to Eduardo's points about piecemealing. I don't think the the staff nor the board want to continue to invest little by little by little in trying to keep that building working. Um, but we need to be thinking about what the larger investments are for this entire transit district, meaning what is the use of that station look like and, and is it encouraging for ridership and is it a good place that employees feel supported and they have you know their needs met there as well. So uh, there's no question that the repairs need to happen so that people can continue to work there and be safe and have a, an environment that is um, workable for a while. <clears throat> But then the larger question is, how does this fit into the transit district's needs overall? And then how does that fit in with the partnership with the city, which is really dependent upon an active and thriving transit uh, system to really support a lot of the housing and other uh, economic development activities we have happening downtown. Mm -hmm. And I know that, that staff from Metro and the city are meeting and talking about that and working together to find mutually beneficial um, solutions to that. Rutkin? I think another part of the answer to this question is how we started this project. When it began, uh, we believed that the city council believed that the um, private sector, the housing development part of this thing would generate so much money that they would subsidize the transit piece of this and we wouldn't have to spend as much money. And we had earmarks in Congress and a member of the Appropriations Committee in Sam Farr so that we thought we'd be able to get additional funding that they could do he'd been getting for us for years Well, they got rid of earmarks. Maybe they're bringing them back, we'll see. But they got rid of earmarks and, and uh, Sam Farr is no longer, on, we have a new Congress member who's low seniority and not on the Appropriations Committee. So all the sort of money that was gonna rain down on this project went away and now it comes down to whether we would cut bus service to create a brand, you know, something at this scale, which of course we would never do. So it, I do appreciate the uh, uh, Capital Projects Committee going into this because one of the issues that hasn't been talked about but should be clear to everybody is we, we, we try to protect this PTMI SCA money and hold on to it and see if we could use it for this. But the reality is, for the reasons that were expressed here, it, that's not really something we can do at this point. And we, it's limited ability to use for a variety of things really means that this is an appropriate way to spend the money for this. But I do appreciate the time that committee spent trying to wrestle with these issues and figure out whether this was a reasonable expenditure from this source for this project. Uh, Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, with regard to the question about the bathroom, do we expect to be looking at, at that anytime soon? I think the best answer is we keep looking at it. We, we, we spend a lot of money on those restrooms mm -hmm. and then they get trashed mm -hmm. again and again and again. So there may be a broader question in the future irrespective of what happens with this facility or new facility. Do we build facilities with restrooms? Try to keep up. There's, oh. We're going to keep on spending, sp spending some money to, to, to try to get these to some level of maintenance. Yes, yeah. we have to. <coughs> it, it, unless we're ready to padlock those doors, and I don't think we are, um, I hope we not. have to do it. And we'll keep it's doing it we as we have. Like Unfortunately, it just gets years. beat up. Yeah, I'm um, talk you would about think the folks that use those facilities would respect that we're, we've, we've created a, a public facility for them to utilize. And, they would treat it nice. I, I, I'm clueless why somebody would choose to go in there and trash those places. Director Matthews. Um, are you in communication with our public works department? We have the same problem in yep. all our, yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah. No, I'm just agreeing that we have this constant same issue. We're going for yep. state of the art. <laughs> 
or trending? It, it just FYI. It, it may be that Somewhat self-contained. Um, we looked in anyway. Our public works department has really invested a huge amount of effort in this. You may have that conversation. Um, one factor in terms of the expected funding way back in the day and reality now is, of course, redevelopment disappeared as and well. I'm, I've left that piece out. Yeah. No um, more redevelopment agencies. And I again want to just stress: it's been a thread throughout here. No one is interested in throwing good money after bad, and it is kind of galling to spend even this amount of money, but given the timeline for any improved facility, people have to be able to work. So right. uh, the conclusion was unfortunately self-evident. Yeah. Uh, Director Botter, who's on the Capital <coughs> Committee. Yeah, I want to thank the Board for indulging the uh, Capital Committee for bringing mm -hmm. this back. We, we had some concerns about, you know, the, the dwindling capital fund, which I think we're all trying to protect. And we're down to 1.9 million, and I see a bigger dip here. Um, and we all had projects that we want to fund, and the money has been spent on good projects. Back to the to the building itself. I think the important thing that we need to be aware of is, is even though their estimates are for $350,000 for the roof and the uh, windows, given the nature of this building, and and the reports that were given to me is that this problem has been going on for a long time. So we all need to be aware that that the cost is for replacing the roof and for the windows, and it doesn't include maybe a little anticipation, a little, Aaron, but a little anticipation of the damage that has occurred over a long period of time with dry rot and other conditions in that building. So I just think the board really needs to be aware that 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 in my estimation from, from contracting business, this could go from 350 to double that uh, by the time we finish this. With that being said, it's still very vital that we do, you know, as Wardo mentioned, we do need to take care of our building. Cynthia bring up a good point. You know, we, we, we don't want to put good money into bad. We have this study done. We're hoping to get some insight on it. Uh, I'd like to really think about good potential projects that enhance our delivery. But for right now, uh, I think the committee was unanimous on that this is a good investment of our money at this time to do these repairs. Thank you. Um, not to not to bring the bathrooms back up, but I'm going to. <laughs> but um, I I I was thinking that I mean, do we need to make them like public so that people can just walk in there freely? I mean, some places you can go and you maybe can go to the customer service booth and get a coin and and then be able to enter the restroom. Um, you know, we might want to think of something like that for both stations. I'd be completely supportive of that in Watsonville. Um, I know we do have some of the newer bathrooms, but I think they need to be redundant as well. But I think a policy like that would um, probably cut back on a lot of the damage that you, you're going to be seeing from people just randomly walking into the bathroom, um, using them, and then destroying them. So um, I'm hopefully maybe that's a further conversation we can have about the bathrooms. Because it honestly, there's no point fixing them if they're just going to continue to go down the same path um, and then um, and be abused. And like you said, I have no idea why people just go in there and vandalize. So um, if that, that could be a good, um, a, a good kind of like meeting place. And um, I'd love to have that conversation, at least for the Watsonville station, if, and hopefully maybe Santa Cruz is on, on board with that as well. And, um, and I, and I want to say I do agree with, you know, actually, you know, f maintaining your buildings that we see, we've seen in our city alone with the, the problems of not maintaining what we own, and then they start fa failing. And that cost is a lot more than what it is if you can just start preserving. And, um, you know, we, we decided to, to go in a different direction with our Watsonville station, and it's looking really gorgeous. And, and, I, um, and I think that with just, you know, doing a little bit of a fix up just between, you know, windows and, and a, 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 um, a roof, and I guess you guys have already done a paint job, or did you not do a paint job already? We did. We did. Oh, you did? Well, okay. I think that all helps because, you know, to me, aesthetics are really important, and it, it means that you're taking pride in your in when you when you take care of what you have. That's taking pride, and pride is important. And I think that it shows that you know that, that Metro is taking pride in their their um, their uh, facilities. I think it says that you know it takes pride in the city of Santa Cruz when facilities look nice, and that's really important. So I I, I want to say that I encourage this, and uh, like I said, I, I you know I do know how construction works, so. It could be 700 by the end. I, I know that you guys don't want to hear that, but um, whatever it takes to make this building look nice and safe and um, you know usable, that's great. Director Rothwell. Um, if you're having that much water damage, do you have any idea whether there is a mold issue? Because I can't imagine that you have all of this leakage from water and that there isn't then a mold problem. And that to me, that's a health issue. And that I think also, um, is a liability issue. 
So for us not to take care of that immediately seems to me to be very short-sighted. There isn't any evidence that's on the exterior at this point, but that's definitely a big concern once we open that up. Rick, it, it could be that. Yeah, black mold might, is almost a sure thing. Absolutely, and that's, again, the health of our employees and the public in the building. Director Reckon? Maybe this is getting embarrassingly personal, but I want to say, as someone who comes off the Highway 17 and rides other buses around town, and I'm a senior, um, you cannot imagine a transit district that doesn't have public restrooms. I'm sorry, that's not even on the agenda as a possibility. How we're going to maintain them, what kind they're going to be, but you know, there's no personnel around there after six o'clock, so you can't use coins or the key to the restroom or anything else. They have to be available when you get off the bus. I'm sorry. Speaking for myself and others <laughs> like me. <laughs> you gotta train your bladder yeah. better. Any other comments from the board? Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not always trainable. Uh, uh, Director I'll Matthews. Go ahead and mo move just the just recommendation. I'll second, second the motion. Second. Motion by Matthews, second by Bator to um, approve the recommendation. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. Uh, we are, uh, we, I'm going to pull item number 18 to be discussed probably at our next meeting. So we will, uh, that completes our regular agenda. We will recess to closed session. We have one item uh, to discuss. Is there anything reportable? Uh, there won't be any reportable action. There will not be anything reportable. Okay, so I'm, we'll be going back into this room here. Uh, so we will adjourn then and now to our next meeting, Friday, April 27th at 9 a.m. at the Metro offices at 110 Vernon Street. Thank you and have a nice day. <laughs>